I'd like to get started by introducing one of our speakers who's going to discuss how communities across the country are leveraging community paramedicine and mobile integrated health for better patient care. Chris Call is a familiar name in EMS. He's a co-founder of EMS One and founder of Paramedic.com. Chris got his career start as a firefighter and EMT. He's worked as a firefighter captain, paramedic, and ambulance service director. Service director. Most recently, he practiced as a critical care flight paramedic covering Southwest rural Montana and Yellowstone National Park. With over 26 years of experience, Chris serves as the Chief Marketing Officer of Pulsera, a healthcare and EMS tech startup. Welcome, Chris, and now I'm gonna turn the webinar over to you so we can get started with today's presentation. Great, thank you. This is really exciting for me. When we talk about community paramedicine, everybody has a different idea of what community paramedicine is. And that's not unreasonable. It's not unreasonable because what your needs in your community may be, may be different than the needs of my community. And that's really what the community paramedicine focus is. Today we're gonna to talk about that and how to implement and start looking at ways that the world can be changed because of community paramedic and this expanded scope of practice. Really to its core and by definition, community paramedicine allows paramedics to function outside of their traditional emergency responses. Where we always went to the patient, we may have treated them, but most often we transported them to a hospital. Now that hospital may or may not be the correct place. As we walk through this, you're gonna learn different steps and unique wins around the country that have helped shape and make our health system greater and, and more, more robust because of an expanded scope scope of medicine. As paramedics, we look at it as this is what we've always done. And we're in that dynamic of change where how EMS and how paramedicine may have looked in the 70s, 80s, 90s will look vastly different in the future. One of our challenges as we move into community paramedicine is being able to connect the right people with the right resources at the right time. And communication will be a super difficult uh, hurdle for us to overcome. As I look at it, and of course, my, my background in communication and working with Pulsera is that we need a way for us to, at the time of an incident, make sure that we can connect with the right provider. That could be mental health. It could be a family practice physician. It could be telemedicine. It could be a number of different areas so that we can grasp the right information at the right time for the right patient so we can treat them appropriately and if needed, transport them appropriately. As you look at this graph or in this image, you can see there's a lot of arrows in there. And really, if you look at the yellow ambulances in the circle and you look over to the emergency room, that's what we've done in the past. And when we look at those and we think through how do we connect there, it's been historically through a cell phone or through a handheld radio. But now our focus is more along that of the hospital. And when you look at on the side of the white side where you're looking at all the different practitioners needing to get different information from different clinicians at different times, it becomes a tangled web. In our new focus of EMS, we're gonna start working in that area. One of the things I wanna caution us on is change management. How do we make sure that we are making the right decisions at the right time? It's one thing for us to talk about what we could do as community paramedics. It's another thing for us to talk about how would the world work best if it was through my lens or your lens. It's different to actually put that change into practice and actually have different outcomes. We love this graph. When I'm looking at this, what it says is managing complex change is a challenge and it's difficult at best. And really there's five different things that you need to do when managing change. You need to have the vision. You need to provide people with the skills necessary to do their job. You need to incentivize them. Why are they doing this? Is this something just added extra to their job or is there a reason behind it? You need to provide them all the resources in order to equip them to do that job. 
and then you need an action plan. Turns out, if you're missing any one of those five steps, the end result is not change management. In fact, if you're missing vision, for example, you'll see that people will be confused. And I'm sure that many of you have had this happen in the past. If you have vision and the incentives and the resources, but you haven't provided your medics the training and skills, there's anxiety. If you don't share with people the why that you're doing it, they'll be resistant to that change. If you share the why, they're excited, you have the skills, the action plan, but they don't have the resources, you'll see frustration. And the worst is if you get all the way to the end, but you don't have a plan. And today, that's what we're gonna be talking about, a plan, so you don't have a false start when it comes to community paramedicine. As we walk through this today, there's a lot of buzzwords out there. Community paramedicine, mobile integrated health, ET3, and there's been a lot of buzz around these concepts in the EMS community. But what does it actually look like when a community implements a paramedic program, a community paramedicine program? And what are the specific patient care and communication benefits that those sites have seen? Today, we're gonna to walk through these next three objectives. We're gonna talk about implementing a community paramedicine program in your community. We're gonna talk about leveraging the benefits of launching a community paramedicine program from the wins of others. And we're gonna talk about overcoming some of the barriers when starting a paramedic program. With me is Ann Montera. Ann has spent the past 25 years as a nurse in public health, labor and delivery, working with patient safety and quality improvement, and then as an EMS coordinator in both urban and rural hospitals and the community settings. And recently completed her master's degree in health leadership from Western's Governor, Governor's University. And her years in EMS experience in health leadership led her to become the executive director for the Central Mountains RETAC, supporting a six county EMS and trauma region in Colorado. And is also currently serving her second term on the National Advisory Council as a vice chair and representing the public health sector. My friend Anne has a strong passion for changing our healthcare system. As a patient, she's experienced the dysfunction firsthand. Knowing that a large percentage of medical errors involve bad communication, Anne has become a change agent to improve the current and fragmented system of care. Most importantly, she's a rad friend of mine and a colleague that I've been blessed to know over the past decade. And incidentally, as we are talking about community par paramedicine, it's a fun fact that Anne is the co-creator and public health partner for the first national community paramedic pilot program in rural Eagle, Colorado. Anne, welcome. Thank you so much, Chris, for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, there's also another side note that I'm also working with Pulsera as the client service specialist, but I come to you today as um, a community paramedic veteran, if you could say, into some sort and share some of my knowledge and expertise going um, through this journey over the last 10 years. And I just really appreciate EMS1 and Pulsera for giving me this opportunity to share this. Um, I've done tons of presentations and I think this one is near and dear to my heart because I'm going to start with a case study of someone that I know personally and um, to kind of sh share through this journey. I would love for you to meet Chance. Chance is, his name is Chance because there was no way on this earth that he would have ever even made it to even being born. He had so many complications in preterm. Um, when his mother was pregnant, but he did make it and he is alive and well on this earth. But I want to tell you a little bit about Chance. He's, um, he was a mover and a shaker. He had an older brother, loving life. But when he turned two and a half years old, he had his very first seizure. From that point, the seizure started coming over and over and over again. At one point, he had 180 seizures per day on average. Imagine that. As providers, when we just handle a patient with one seizure, could you imagine being a parent and taking care of your two-year-old having over 180 seizures a day? He was diagnosed with every type of ep epilepsy, and he needed to be continuously monitored. He was taken to Children's Hospital in Colorado, the Mayo Clinic, in Minnesota and just was constantly getting tests done and trying to figure out and get to the source of the problem. Enter into the school system. He did make it till he was five and he was able to make it to where he could go to school for the very first time. But going into a school system in Eagle County, a population of 50,000, 
there was only one registered nurse for 28 schools. Could you imagine a little boy having multiple seizures up to maybe 100 a day during the school on um, some days? How could this one nurse or the system handle and take care of chance? 911 was called on a weekly basis to come in and transport him, not having the resources to know what to do or how to manage it. This is just painting a slight picture of now we're gonna go into the different other parts of how a community can come around a patient such as this and really understanding why is there a need in our community. When looking at that, I want us to think about this changing landscape of our healthcare system. Healthcare reimbursement is changing. Our healthcare system from day to day, we don't know what's gonna be reimbursed, what medication is gonna cost an arm and a leg, if those emergency medicine medications that Chance was needing just to survive, will his parents be able to afford it? Maybe 10 years ago, an EpiPen of some sort would have cost $100, but now it could cost $3,000. How do we know what's going to um, be the next barrier to our health care? We need to look to all these different creative ways to deliver care. We need to look within our community at the needs, and we also need to look um, around to different resources and help each other out as care providers. There is a growing need for more nurses and care providers, but as we're seeing across the country, uh, there's an aging population where nurses are retiring. We have only, we only have one in three public health providers that are available to meet all the public health needs that we have. And we have job lists after job lists for EMTs and paramedics still going unfilled. So this broken system, patients are getting missed and we really need to find a way to deliver the appropriate care at the appropriate time with the appropriate resources. This is that complex challenge that we all are faced with. So in this crazy world that we're living in, all these different medical needs sometimes can be missed completely, they can be misappropriated, or they could lack resources or getting the wrong resources. This provides a lot of problems. The overcrowding of EDs, the overutilization of 911, the underutilization of other resources. So what can we do as a whole system, as patients of the healthcare system, as providers in the system, to look creatively outside of all of what's going on to fit this need? So I'm gonna start with just taking you through an example of a patient demand on the healthcare system. I want each of you to envision a thousand people. So that a thousand people could be in your community, in a, your, the size of your high school, it could be your entire county size. But I want you to think of that thousand people. And in one day, there are 250 of them will have some sort of some, something that goes wrong with their health. They could have a headache, they could have a heart attack, they could break a leg. Of those 250 people, only 75 of them are going to be able to handle that without any medical care. Of those, well, 75 of them are going to be able to care for it on their own. Now, 25 are going to need some sort of primary care that they need to access during that day. Of the 25, three will need some sort of specialty care, and one will need to, to be hospitalized. So just think of that thousand people and the resources that maybe the thousand people will have access to. So I want to kind of change this up just a tad and kind of take it to put it into a different population for you to think about. So I'm going to what I call is Eagle Countyize the population. Like I said before, we have a population of 50,000. So um, this is something, again, you'll have access to these resources later for you to then work these numbers in your own area. But in our 50,000 population, we are located up in the heart of the Rocky Mountains with ski resorts of Vail and Beaver Creek, one critical access hospital, and the second busiest airport in the state. Up here in each day, we'll have a, over 12,000 people that are gonna have some sort of health need that goes on. Of the 12,000, a little under 4,000 are gonna be able to um, not need 
too much of that care to be able to need to access it. They're going to be able to care that care for that on their own. But 1,200 are going to need to access our primary care. Now, when we started our community paramedic program here in Eagle County almost 10 years ago, at that time, and we identified such a need and a gap, there was only four primary care practices in the county and only one accepted Medicare and Medicaid. So if at that time we had a 26% uninsured rate, how would 26% of the 1,200 that needed to access primary care actually get seen. Then we went into this idea of the specialty care and also looking into rural areas and accessing um, rural needs. And 150 of those people are gonna need to have some sort of specialty care. Well, if you're up here and you break a leg skiing, we've got the specialist, but we lack in cardiology and neurology and other specialists. A neurologist that maybe chance might need someday. And then of those 150, 50 would need to be hospitalized. Um, and I misspoke, it wasn't a critical access hospital that we have, but we have a 58 bed hospital. So in one day, if we don't have the appropriate resources and needs to care for all these patients, how will them all the way down to 50 people to be hospitalized a day be able to be cared for? In our normal traditional setting of the four walls of the hospital, I think that we need to start looking into the next area of outside those four walls and breaking down silos to meet these needs. 